everyone. After the Southern Poverty Law Center has declared Majid Nawaz, who is a Muslim, and Ayan Hirsali, who is an ex-Muslim, anti-Muslim extremists, I had to concede that I have no longer any clue what anti-Muslim extremism, or for that matter Islamophobia, actually means. So to better up my understanding, I found a series to explain it to me. Top hat! Wait a second, how is being concerned about women's freedoms even remotely phobic? We have it black on white that in certain Islamic countries women are not free to choose what they wear. If you consider it Islamophobic that people worry about it as soon as they see a person in a niqab or in a burqa, you're basically saying that the problem is not the problem, but acknowledging the problem is the problem. It's like calling a guy worried about the safety of gays a homo- Oh come on, why are you taking so long? It's just an intro. Sorry, let's continue. Yeah, I can see why that one is offensive too. I mean, anyone implying that an Islamophobe has to be a cis white male is a total sexist and racist. Sorry, but if you get your kid to believe and fear hellfire, that is brainwashing. That applies to Christianity just as much as it applies to Islam. Or the holy church of stinky toenails for that matter. Treating you like everyone else is not Islamophobic. For fuck's sake, Izet. You pause the video every two and a half seconds and then talk for like an hour. Let him at least get through the intro. Sorry. Right person, thank you. This is so... I kind of like those patriarchal bondage techniques. One of the most interesting books I have ever read. Oh, hi, weird presenter who doesn't present himself. How should I call you? Lord Grep? Nah, too technical. Hmm, let's see. So your channel says you're called Fadel Soliman. So how about I call you Fadi? Oh, cute. It's a book called There is a God by Anthony Flew, who was a professor of philosophy at Oxford University. Really? To me, it just seemed this usual dogmatic days nonsense. But hey, if you liked it, I'm absolutely happy for you. Anthony Flew was perhaps the most notorious atheist throughout the world. Through his work related to philosophy and religion, he must have been responsible for converting tens or even hundreds of thousands to atheism. Uh, I am a bit confused because that guy and his book seem completely unrelated to the topic. However, in 2004, he turned the tables and astonished everyone when he wrote a book called There is a God, in which he declared that he now believes in the existence of God. Fadi, a person converting from atheism to deism has no impact on the validity of your claims. When you ask an atheist, where did we come from? They merely answer, we came into being by chance. The word chance here is quite amusing really, because not only did we not come by chance, but there is not a single thing in the world that came by chance. Everything occurs through God's providence. Yeah, QED atheists, I debunked your claim that you totally didn't make. That we came by chance, and to think that is totally Islamophobic. See what I did there? Yeah, I strammed you. Because you didn't say it is Islamophobic. The same way atheists and scientists don't tell you that the world came by mere chance. Evolution is not mere chance, but mutation being favored by the environment. Stars are also not mere chance. They are a result of several chemical and physical processes that are known to us and that we can calculate and measure. Some scientists actually agree with you and argue that there is no chance in the universe, none whatsoever, because every atom simply reacts to its environment. And that means that it has absolutely no freedom to choose any other path. But you, Fadi, went one step further. You argued that everything is made by design. Droughts, cancer, earthquakes and tsunami were deliberately designed from your fancy creepy daddy in the sky to make little baby people suffer and die. That is not just scary and disgusting, it is also a claim that requires evidence. So, 
Where is your evidence? God Almighty says, Indeed, all things have we created in proportion and measure. And we can read this information in a fancy book written by a scribe of an illiterate warlord who heard voices in his head from the Almighty God delivered to him via magical farts. You would never accept Joseph Smith's divinely inspired scribblings. And yet you demand people to accept the slightly more bloodthirsty Islamic equivalent of Joseph Smith as valid evidence. To those who say that everything in the world came by chance, I say, why has it never happened that a mango seed grew into a fig tree? By chance. Not once, never did a grape plant produce marrows or watermelons. By chance. Not once. Well, obviously, because its DNA contains the building patterns of a grape plant, not a watermelon. But you know what's funny about that? If a grape plant would grow into a watermelon, you would consider that a miracle and contribute it to your God. You know, this whole debunking stuff is all fun, but I would really love to hear about Islamophobia. Could you please- Nothing in this world comes to be by chance. I would like to respond to those who claim that there is no creator by using the words of a great French philosopher who has also happened to be an engineer called René Descartes. You really want to prove Islamic faith by citing a Catholic Frenchman? René Descartes says, I doubt God's existence. And you assume God's existence in the first place. I doubt therefore, I think. Yes, being able to doubt like a human requires a brain like a human, and being able to think like a human requires a brain like a human. Therefore, if you have a human brain that is functional, it means you can doubt and think. I think therefore, I am. Well, not quite. You see, Everyone assumes that they are here and that they are alive and that they think, because they seem to think and they seem to be alive. But I cannot prove whether or not I'm really here and whether or not I'm really alive. There is nothing I can do to actually test that. We have to make this assumption for practical purposes, which is why even scientists make this assumption. However, given the fact that it is just an assumption, we cannot use it as a fact to prove something else. I exist, therefore I was created. Existence doesn't imply a creator. At best, it implies a cause. If you say that your existence is proof that there is a creator, then that existence alone is not enough to prove a creator. Since I did not create myself, then someone else must have created me. This one is simply based on a previous flawed assumption. On top of it, it has to be proven that there is a creator and it has to be proven that it's one creator and not many. Harmful opinions is God. Harmful opinions is God. Harmful opinions is God. And that someone is God, the creator. And this conclusion is nothing else but a concatenation of assumptions. He assumed that he was created, then that there was only one creator and then that creator happened to be the creator that he happens to worship because of how he grew up. <sighs> I can't believe I made this in one take. And now I have a sore throat. Okay, guys, I'll be right back. I need a drink. By the way, you kinda missed a few lines in there. You know, the ones where Descartes explained that he can imagine a perfect being, but isn't himself perfect, and therefore a perfect being has to exist. A bit like if you can imagine a pink invisible unicorn, and you are not a pink invisible unicorn, it proves that pink invisible unicorns exist. Come to think of it, your lack of understanding the problems with Descartes' arguments explains quite neatly how you could possibly mistake atheism for Islamophobia. So his doubt led him to believe. His doubt in God led him to believe in God. Uh, no. His belief led him to believe that his doubt was a sign of his belief. Actually, something similar to this reasoning is summarized in a very short yet beautiful verse of the Quran. Oh. Finally, will you tell us how Descartes is Islamophobic? Or maybe that Islamophobes are also Descartophobes? The impact of this verse is described by a man called Jubair ibn Mut'am ibn Adi and who had been caught by the Muslims during the Battle of Badr. He recounts that as he was entering Medina as a prisoner of war, prisoner of war, prisoner of war. Oh yeah, I forgot that Muhammad attacked that place a couple of times. May peace be upon them. He heard the Prophet peace be upon him praying and reciting the following verse from the Quran. Were they created without a creator or were they their own creators? But that has nothing to do with... Wait a second. What if it's not us being Islamophobes but you being an atheistophobe? 
He recounts that when he heard this verse, he felt suddenly spellbound. He felt himself soaring. Are you telling me that the Quran is so bad that instead of being worried about his execution, the guy felt sorry for himself for hearing only one verse? Uh, I think he meant soaring, not sorry. Oh. Because the magnificent concept, similar to the one later expressed by Descartes, had been so eloquently expressed in this short verse. Just because something sounds pretty to you doesn't make it true. Nor does the fact that different people come up with something similar give it any more credibility. Mathematicians often challenge atheists who work in the fields of biology and physics because mathematicians deal with invariable facts. One plus one equals two. This will never change. They deal with what is called the theory of probabilities. It's kind of funny that you mention invariable facts when trying to discredit physicists. A mathematician has to follow mathematic rules, but not much else. A plus A is 2 times A, and this is correct no matter what numbers you use for A. A physicist, on the other hand, has to work within very strict boundaries that reality provides to him. What is the probability that there is no creator? Well, let us look at a simple example. Suppose I get 12 marbles, and I number them from 1 to 12, then put them in a bag, close my eyes, shake the bag, and blindly choose one. What is the probability that I will pull out marble number one? The probability is one in 12. If I return the marble back to the bag, shake it again, and blindly choose a marble once more, what are the odds that I will pull out marble number two? Still one in 12. Oh, I know, I know. Now you will show us how you put the marble back, pray to Mecca, pick one out again, and still have only a probability of 1 in 12. Which therefore means that there is no divine impact, and thus the probability that there is a god is close to zero, right? Seriously though, do you remember what you just said a couple of minutes ago? But there is not a single thing in the world that came by chance. Everything occurs through God's providence. If nothing in this world is by chance, your marble pick is not a matter of chance either. If Allah decides that you pick marble too, there is no 1 in 12 probability for you to pick it. By assuming chance, you completely contradict yourself. But hey, cheer up! Your God totally planned your logical inconsistency too, and totally wanted you to get embarrassed in front of thousands of people. So all is good. So what is the probability that I will get marble number one the first time, followed by marble number two the next time? It is one in 144. In other words, I would have to repeat this experiment 144 times in order to get marble number one, followed by marble number two. Do you know what the probability is of getting all of the marbles in sequence from one to 12? I would have to try 379 million times for that to happen just once. Uh, no. The probability is actually one over 8.9 trillion. Or at least it ought to be if you had any idea about maths. But you exactly showcase what I meant before with mathematicians having no boundaries. If we were to apply this to evolution, the biologist would be restricted by natural selection. If we applied it to chemistry, then the attributes of the marble molecules would have an impact on how likely they would bond with the molecules of your hand. Or if we take physics, then the lighter marbles would be much more likely to be on top and therefore get picked more often. Picking out 12 marbles in sequence seems so impossible. Then what are the odds that this universe, with all its variations, numerations and synchronizations, would come into existence by chance? Clearly above zero, since we are here. Just because something is very improbable doesn't mean that it cannot happen. Aside from that, your approach is very misleading. When you set up a probability game like this, you look for a very, very specific outcome. The universe, however, didn't try to achieve a particular preset pattern. It just happened to turn out this way. The chances for a potentially life caring universe are much more probable than the ones for this specific universe. As every mathematician can tell you. But just in case you ask one, try to find one who can actually do maths. All this enormity, diversity and complexity what are the odds that it could all have come to be without a creator, by chance? And while we're at it, 
what are the odds for a creator? Or what are the odds for having only one creator instead of many? The chances are zero. It is practically impossible. Remember how people said that the possibility of Trump ever getting voted into office is practically zero? Yeah, not the best argument in hindsight, I would say. That is why many mathematicians often challenge those who say there is no creator or... Stop, 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 stop. Okay, listen. I came here to learn about Islamophobia. It is the title of your series and it is the subject of your speech. And yet you didn't mention it once. All you did was warming up old style Christian arguments to try to disprove atheism. You strawmaned them, you discredited them, and you ridiculed them. And so not only did you show us nothing concerning Islamophobia, even less anything connecting atheism to Islamophobia, but you have also shown that if there was such a thing, you would be just as <clears throat> phobic towards atheists, if not more so, than you claim they are towards you and your religion. But we will discuss it in much further detail in the episodes to follow in Islamophobia season 2. I will dig into the rest of your speech another time, because I really have to go now. I have to drive Logic to the store since he can't see anything with that bloody niqab on. He nearly drove that car into the ditch last time, so I won't even let him close to it. God willing. Bye! Please tell me in the comment section what you think about it, subscribe if you haven't yet, and if you have subscribed and think you are subscribed, have a check if that is still active. YouTube turns to unsubscribe people recently, and have a great evening.